Hello, and welcome to our lecture on the police powers and government neutrality. Um, we have, in fact, been talking about both of these for quite some time without really addressing them directly. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll point you to where we have uh, in the past, and I think you'll make some connections that uh, will help you here. So let's get started. Okay, uh, it's important to note that we are switching here with the contract clause chapter and the chapter on substantive economic due process. We're switching from federal to state government regulation. We're switching from the Supreme Court's supervision of federal economic regulation under the Commerce Clause to state economic regulation under the Contract Clause and under the uh, doctrine of substantive due process which the court found in the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. So, recall the Commerce Clause uh, jurisprudence. The court was continually saying only states may regulate things local and intrastate under their police powers. And we never talked about what these police powers were. Well, now we're talking about them because now the, the states actually stepped in and started regulating. Uh, they read the decisions of the Supreme Court in Schechter Poultry and Carter versus Carter Cole, and they, they were like, hey, they say we can regulate things local and interstate, we're going to do it. And that's why we get cases like Home Building and Loan Association versus Blaisdell, uh, and, and a number of other cases that we're going to read here uh, and talk about shortly. So when the court said in all this Commerce Clause jurisprudence, only states may regulate things local and interstate under their police powers, they were talking about an area of law that we are discussing now and we're going to lay out in some detail. So um, when the court says this, though, it doesn't mean that states are unrestricted when they do regulate. The co Contract Clause grants rights to individuals to enter into contracts. And then the Supreme Court starts to think of these contracts as property, as owner, uh, property ownership. In some ways, they are connected to property, obviously, but the court says that people have a substantive right under property rights to contract. So we'll talk about that some more, too. Now, it's important to note that the federal and state governments are different. They are very different forms of government. The federal government is one of specified powers. State governments have a broad and unspecified power called the police powers. Now, the federal government is one uh, that has enumerated powers, and whenever we were talking about the contract clause, um, we, uh, 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 we were talking about the state police powers, right? But when we were talking about the commerce clause, the, uh, the, the, the Supreme Court was talking about a power that been, had been specified in the Constitution that the federal government could use. State police powers are broad and unspecified powers. They are Tenth Amendment powers. In other words, they're powers that weren't granted to the federal government and certainly are reserved for the states. And they can use this power, the police powers, uh, for the general public good. I do want to note that the, the police powers are an ancient power. The first mention of them ranges back to Henry II in England. Um, and so obviously the states had those powers, exercised them as colonies uh, during uh, the colonial era, uh, took those powers over from the British when the United States declared its independence in 1776, and continued to exercise those powers under the Articles of Confederation. Thus, the states had those powers long before the Constitution existed. They predate the Constitution. Now, it's important to note that police powers and government neutrality involve the contract clause and substantive due process for the right to property. Here's a good example of the difference. The federal government may interfere with private contracts when exercising an enumerated or implied power, especially when addressing a, a crisis or emergency of national importance. But the, the important thing to note here is that the federal government has that enumerated or implied power that the Supreme Court interprets 
States, it's not like that. States may not interfere with private contracts unless they can define a public health, safety, welfare, or morals concern. So look at the difference between those two statements. The presumption is that the federal government may interfere with private contracts, but only when they're exercising enumerated or implied powers, and especially when there's a crisis. The presumption on the part of the court for the states, for the exercise of the state power, is the state may not interfere with private contracts unless they can find a public health, safety, and welfare uh, concern. So the presumption is that the states cannot use the power uh, to interfere with contracts, while for the federal government, the presumption is that they may. So let's define police powers and neutrality more clearly. We've been talking about these, and I want to give a very precise definition. You will find that we've discussed some of this already, and that references to neutrality and the police powers run throughout the uh, Commerce Clause jurisprudence. So what is this thing? They are two concepts that are closely related. Uh, so, first, here's a definition of government neutrality. It is an extra textual requirement. In other words, that means that you can't find it in the Constitution. It's not specifically mentioned in the Constitution. It's a Tenth Amendment power. It's extra textual. Okay, so it's outside the Constitution, and it requires that legislatures act only through laws of general applicability. In other words, they have to pass codes and engage in projects that everyone can use. Traffic codes, criminal codes, building roads, providing for public health, all of these things are generally open to the public. They are laws of general applicability. Of course, you know, there are some instances in which they're not quite as generally applicable as we would like. Anybody who's been um, uh, been uh, uh, pulled over uh, after being targeted by police realizes that there's some there are some problems there but the uh, the doctrine is and the hope that we have is that when states act they act only through laws of general applicability they do things that the general public can enjoy and that they must be neutral as to class party or interest Okay, that's the definition of being neutral, of, of acting through laws of general applicability. That's the first side of the coin. That's the government neutrality side. The other side of the coin is the police powers. Okay, so governments, state governments must act neutrally through laws of general applicability unless they can find, uh, they can demonstrate some matter of public concern is at stake. So, um, the states can build a road, right? They can, they can build a road, they can create a, a criminal code. Can they target specific populations for special treatment? Like, can they say, we're going to pass a law that only, only uh, provides goods for this class of people? Like, for example, that gives tax rebates not to everyone, but only to a business that a local, a local government is attempting to lure to the city. Can they do that? In other words, what's a matter of public concern? Is, bringing, uh, is economic development and bringing a specific business and giving them a specific deal, is that a matter of public concern? Yes. The courts would say that anything that threatens the public health, safety, welfare, or morals is a matter of public concern, and specific uh, agreements with, um, with narrow interests, with specific businesses, so long as that business coming to the community can be shown to have a wide benefit, bringing many jobs and supporting the economy broadly, then it's okay. Um, if uh, a deadly disease broke out, would the state be justified in quarantining only people who had been exposed to the disease? Now, that's not a law of general applicability. Right? They're not quarantining everyone. 
Could they just quarantine people who had been exposed to the Ebola virus? Answer, yes. It's a matter of public health, safety, and welfare. Okay, so um, it's important to note that we find the uh, re find restrictions on the police power in the 14th Amendment. Government neutrality and the police powers were largely applied by state courts to the acts of state legislatures before the passage of the 14th Amendment in 1868. In other words, the Supreme Court, as we know, could only review acts of state governments and state courts when they involved interpretation of some provision of the United States Constitution. But the, w w with the, the ratification of the 14th Amendment, we get a, a thing that restricts state power and allows the Supreme Court to begin to apply principles of neutrality and police powers to the states, just like state courts did before the ratification of the 14th Amendment. What, how does it do that? Well, the 14th Amendment includes a due process clause. Um, up until that time, states were not restricted in the Constitution by a due process clause. The federal government was limited uh, by a list of specific rights in the Bill of Rights. And there is a due process clause in the Fifth Amendment, but that due process clause only applies to the federal government. The 14th Amendment gives us a due process clause, but the 14th Amendment doesn't include this list of rights limiting the states. It only says due process. So what does that mean? What does due process mean? Well, the court interpreted that to mean according to the ancient power of the state and according to the way state courts have been interpreting the police powers, that you as a private citizen have a right to neutral government. You have a right to be treated exactly the same as everyone else. You have a right to a government that acts only through laws of general applicability unless the government, uh, state government has been able to identify a matter of public concern. So what are the implications of all this? Well, the implications are that state governments cannot interfere in private contracts unless it is for a public good and that go state governments cannot regulate specific industries in other words, they can't set wages or working hours or working conditions without a public good justification because these things involve taking private property from one person and giving it to another. And that is a violation of due process and one's property rights. Later, the Supreme Court applies exactly this logic to a state taking away someone's private personal civil rights. But initially, the uh, justification for interpreting the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment uh, involved only economic rights, or largely economic rights. If you want to see and how the Supreme Court challenge, uh, uh, tra transfers or transforms its logic uh, in constitutional law and economic rights jurisprudence into civil rights jurisprudence, you should take uh, my civil rights and liberties class because that's exactly where we start. We start with the economic rights and, and then move into civil rights. And I've done a lot of work in this area trying to show that the Supreme Court actually built up all the machinery for understanding due process in terms of economic rights jurisprudence and then later after the New Deal applied it to civil rights. So in conclusion, you need to keep this stuff in mind, these definitions of government neutrality and the police powers. You need to keep this in mind as we read through Lochner, Mueller, Atkins Children's Hospital, and West Coast Hotel, B. Parish, and also read over the document I provide that summarizes government neutrality for you. All right, uh, I hope that helps, and if you are confused, it's okay, because we continue to talk about these two concepts uh, through the rest of the chapter.